Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I don't believe in ghosts, evil spirits, haunted houses, metaphysics, etc. I only believe in science and facts. But sometimes things happen that shred all your beliefs. I want to introduce myself. I'm Lisa. I'm 14 years old. I live with my mom, dad, and grandmother. And they're all very proud of me. I'm the leader of the science club at school, and I've been the perfect student for the past two years. My hobbies are reading, watching educational videos, and learning. I like to discuss matters with rational people, not those who believe in myths, aliens, ghosts, and other such nonsense. I personally think these people have mental issues. One morning, my grandmother passed away. I was sad for a long time because I missed her so much. On the day of her funeral, the whole city must have come to say goodbye. While the priests were praying, I noticed something peculiar about one of the graves in the graveyard. After the prayer ended, I approached the grave in question to investigate. There was some weird writing on it. Then. A wispy, transparent, smoky figure appeared out of nowhere. It said to me, Do not get closer to Donna Median's grave. Beware. I shivered slightly and asked the apparition who Donna was. And it replied, Who was she? She was an evil witch who liked to scare people. She was burned at the stake as a witch. But before her death, she swore a curse that if anyone ever approached her grave, her ghost would haunt that person to the day they die. I did not laugh at the apparition's warning. Instead, I turned and returned home, thinking about what had happened. On a sudden defiant impulse, I decided to visit that grave, that night, to see for myself if the curse was real. I took my dad's flashlight and wore a raincoat. It was pitch black outside. The place was horribly unsettling at night, but I wasn't worried at all. It's not like it was real, right? I entered the gate to the sound of howling dogs and meowing cats. My blood ran cold, and a sudden chill ran through me. I turned on the flashlight and began searching for the grave. My hands were trembling so badly I dropped the flashlight several times. Sometimes I would step on something crunchy, and I would shine the light downward, only to see that I had stepped on an insect. Sometimes I'd see a cat here and there. Then suddenly, I heard an eerie sound close by. I froze, not daring to move. Slowly, I pointed my light towards the sound and gasped as my light illuminated a dark, shadowy figure. It was about my height and dressed all in black. I spun around and fled as rapidly as my faithful feet could carry me. I dove into bed, but I didn't sleep at all that night. I even left the lights on. The next day, when I woke up, I asked my dad if graveyards had ghosts and he wondered why I would ask such a question. I was embarrassed and laughed to hide my fear. I told him that I was just curious. That was all. Dad looked at me suspiciously, but continued. I've heard stories, he said, that some people have seen a ghost of a girl from time to time beside Donna Median's grave. I felt my heart sink, and I asked slowly, Is she about my height and dressed in black? He replied, Yes. That's how I've heard the ghost described. How in the world did you know that? I looked down casually and answered, Oh, I read an article about it on the internet last night. My head hurt just thinking about this ghost thing. I made up my mind to prove or disprove it once and for all. I called my friend Laura and persuaded her to come with me to the grave. The following night, we met at the stroke of midnight at the entrance to the graveyard. Laura was shaking and constantly casting glances right and left. The weather was rainy and gloomy. The ground was muddy, and cats were meowing everywhere. It would have made the perfect setting for a supernatural horror movie. While we were looking for Donna's grave, flying bats would occasionally startle Laura, causing her to scream alarmed. As we approached Donna's grave, we suddenly heard a sound behind us. We both turned around at the same time and screamed. A ghost was glaring at us. It asked angrily, What are you doing beside my grandmother's grave? Wait a minute. Are you girls? She uncovered her face, revealing that she was just a girl, and a beautiful one at that. She told us that her name was Carmen, and asked me to turn off the flashlight, because it hurt her eyes. I did. Then I asked, 
Who are you? She replied. I'm the fifth grandchild of Donna Median, the poor woman in this grave, who has been wrongly accused. We both whispered back, Wrongly accused? She continued saying, Yes, she was a victim of the Holocaust during World War II. Afterwards, she became a simple doctor who treated people who were afflicted with epilepsy. As usual, there are always some small-minded superstitious people looking to make trouble for others. They accused her of being a witch because they considered epilepsy to be a disease caused by a demon's touch. I come here every day to put flowers on her grave. People have mistaken me for a ghost because I only come at night. I don't want people to know I'm related to someone they think to be a witch. I don't want to be shunned, scorned, or gossiped about. I tried to comfort her and calm her a little by saying, Don't worry, Carmen. Your grandmother's spirit may be able to rest in peace if you tell people the truth now. We live in more modern times, and when there's no need to worry, I won't tell anyone about you being the ghost. It'll be our little secret. Carmen laughed. She and I became good friends after that. Ever since that day, whenever I hear someone talking about ghosts, I just look at the photo I took of Carmen and I, and I break out laughing. Some people live their lives not fully appreciating what others do for them. They start taking things for granted, thinking that that's exactly how it's supposed to be. Parents sacrifice a lot for their children, and when the children appreciate and try their best in life, that would be worth more than any words can ever describe. My name is Megan, and I hope to inspire you with my story. I lived with my father and my sister, Marlene, after the death of my mother, who died from an illness. Though I was only 18 at the time, I became responsible for taking care of the whole family. I did everything for them, cooking, cleaning, washing. My father was a great man and he did his best to make us happy. I supported both my sister and my father. We faced everything together. There was one more person in my life, my neighbor, Dave. We practically grew up together, and our dreams grew with us. He knew everything about our circumstances and supported me often. He proposed to me and we got engaged. Dave chose a flat near my family so we would be close to them. That was very thoughtful of him. We got married and started our lives. I was determined to finish college and Dave helped me in every way that he could. He proved to me every day how responsible and considerate he was. One day, while cleaning the house, my heart started beating rapidly, and I couldn't breathe well. I was barely able to call out to Dave, who came immediately when he heard me cry for help. I had had this symptom before, when I was younger, but I never told my father, because I didn't want to worry him. Dave took me to the hospital, where a doctor said that I had a serious heart condition, and not just that, I was pregnant, too. Pregnancy and a heart condition do not make a good combination, so we had to choose between the baby's life and mine. My father and Dave asked me to abort the child, though they tried really hard to persuade me. I resolutely refused. I agonized a lot during my pregnancy. They were all so worried for my safety. My father and Marlene left their flat to come and live with me, and Dave cut back on his working hours to stay with me. When the day came, they took me to the hospital. The doctor checked the condition and said that it was too serious, that I wouldn't be able to survive the childbirth. My family and I were shocked. I held Dave's hand and told him that I was strong enough to make it. Dave hugged me and cried. I was so afraid, but I did my best to hide it. I said to my baby, I'm trying the best I can. I'm fighting so that both of us could have a life. Know that I love you, and I know that you'll grow up to be very successful, but you'll also be caring and kind. Surrogate mom. Intriguing title, isn't it? I confess I didn't expect to be a mom at such a young age, but the circumstances often determine the path we should take for us. My mom was the reason I made this choice. But please, hold your judging to the end. Wait until you hear my story. My name is Rita, and I'm 17 years old. I was happy living with my family. My father was a doctor. My mother was a housewife. I had two younger sisters, Carla and Sarah and we lived in a nice, quiet neighborhood. Our home was always filled with joy and laughter. My father was a great dad, and my mother was a fantastic mom. We enjoyed a stable life, until mom suddenly fell ill. She started having frequent headaches. My father took her to the neurologist, and he said that her situation was serious, that she needed urgent surgery. Our life was suddenly turned upside down. We became sad and depressed. None of us talked much. Father was always trying to console mom, but whenever he was alone, he cried just like we did. 
our life became gloomy. The doctor scheduled a date for the surgery, and the closer the date got, the more anxious we became. When the day finally arrived, we packed some of Mom's things to take to the hospital. She looked as if it would be her last time to see us. I had a bad feeling about this. When we arrived at the hospital, Mom called me over and said, Rita, you have to take care of your father and sisters. I suddenly panicked, and I told her, Mom, stop talking like that. You're going to get better and come back home. She put her hand over my mouth and said, Of course I will, but you need to take care of them while I'm gone. Will you do this for me? I was crying, but I tried to calm down and nodded. Then the doctor called her in. She hugged everyone and went into the operating room for surgery. We waited outside the room, worried. After a short while, the doctor came out and called my father in quickly. I knew what had happened from the expression on the doctor's face. Father came back out a few minutes later and looked at us. We were crying, and he hugged us. Our life fell into a miserable, boring routine. Father and my sisters were always sad, and I did my best to try and take care of them. One day, Father called me to him and said, You know how much I love you, all of you, but sometimes we have to make difficult decisions. I don't like the sound of that. He said that he's going to have to get remarried. I took two steps back and said, Get married again. But why? And he told me. He told me we needed someone to take care of us. And he knows that no one can take my mother's place, but I didn't want him to finish. And I said, Father, I will never take mother's place. And no one ever can. But I will do my best. I'll do everything she used to do. I'm old enough and responsible enough. I can handle this. Besides, I promised Mom that I would. He looked at me intently and gave up the idea of getting remarried right away. At first, it was very hard for me to learn to do all the things, the cleaning, the cooking, but I got used to it. Step by step, I searched the internet for tips to make my job easier and more efficient. I asked my sisters not to make a mess at home, and they were more than helpful. I would buy them presents every now and then. My cooking improved after many failed attempts. Whenever I got tired and wanted to quit, I would just remember Mom's face and it would give me strength to go on. Ten years later, I am still the mom of the house. Dad hasn't remarried yet. My sisters grew up and are doing well in their studies. Our flat is always clean, and we're happy again. The road has been long, but I did what I had to, and I did it well.